trade is the key to prosperity. Free trade will bring on a great depression. The North American Union is the merger of the United States, Mexico, and Canada into one super country. I don't see the likelihood of establishing a North American Union in our lifetimes. The road to North American Union is not an, a new development. Canadians are saying no to the North American Union and yes to Canada's sovereignty. The discussion here, and certainly I've been part of it and, and an advocate of it in a way, is that Canada the US, the US should seek to have a deeper type of integration with more predictable rules. Our economies now are very integrated. Our societies are growing increasingly integrated. What's needed now is a North American idea for all three. What kind of stuff was discussed at this meeting regarding the future of North America? I don't remember exactly. There are clear economic benefits from having a common currency. And he said himself, there will be a North American Union, a one North American currency called the Miro. I'm a staunch Canadian nationalist because of globalism. It's essentially the centralization of power into fewer hands. Canadians, Americans, and Mexicans will lose their sovereignty. Maybe national sovereignty is not such a good thing. I don't buy into the conspiracy theories around meetings. Do not be embarrassed. Do not be shy. Do who cares if they call you conspiracy theorists? This is the truth. You get political change of fundamental nature of this sort only if you have a real big earth-shaking event. It's not going to stop with the North American Union. It's going to be one further step along the road to one world government. <laughs> one world government? <laughs> yeah. Um, I personally think it will come. It will come. time serving as the Canadian ambassador to the United States and subsequently helping forge the free trade agreement between Canada and the US, did you ever discuss the possibility of creating a North American Union that would be much like the existing European Union? No, that was never discussed, no. I, I think this was seen when it was launched by the Mulroney government in 1985. It was seen as a trade agreement. We didn't even talk of it at that time. The government did not want to talk of it at that time as a free trade agreement. It was seen as a comprehensive trade agreement with the United States, not with Mexico or any other partner. It was bilateral in concept. As time went on, we began to talk about it on both sides of the border as a free trade agreement. But there was never a notion, to my knowledge, anywhere in the system uh, up on top or in the bowels that thought of this as a North American Union. After the free trade agreement was signed in 1989 and came into force, the United States and Mexico decided that they wanted to have a similar agreement. And they began to, they proposed negotiations on a bilateral basis between the two countries to have another FTA of their own. Canada was concerned about that because we felt, among other things, that it could be a painful experience if Mexico, for example, were able to get a better deal than we did or get concessions that we didn't in order to protect our interests. Uh, and they were actually going to model their agreement on the Candy West Agreement. It was going to be a Candy West Agreement, whatever add-ons they could put or adjustments. So we said, well, we want to be part of the negotiation. So then NAFTA came into existence and you had there for the first time the notion of trilateralism or a North American continent. One has to look at what has been the, the effects of uh, these agreements. And they've been very good for some powerful sectors and not at all good for um, poorer people, for working people, for those that um, are not 
benefiting from, from corporate profits. So here in Canada, for example, since we signed the uh, bilateral free trade agreement with the United States, two-thirds of Canadian families have experienced a decline in their real incomes. Uh, also, if we want to talk about the North American Free Trade Agreement in Mexico, some two million Mexican uh, campesinos, that is peasant farmers, have been displaced from their land. Some have migrated to cities, about half a million every year try to enter illegally into the United States to find work. So it's not so good for people at the bottom of the social ladder. The Zapatistas who launched their rebellion on January 1st, 1994, accusing uh, the problems of Chiapas on NAFTA got it backwards. Uh, the problem of Chiapas in southern Mexico and all of southern Mexico is not NAFTA, it's the absence of NAFTA. It's I think the, the beauty of North America is that our three countries are pragmatic and they're problem solvers. They ask themselves, we've got a problem here in our economy, we've got a problem here on our borders, we have a problem in the environment, how are we going to solve it? Uh, is the best way to solve it is if we do it at the local level, at the national level, uh, or would it make more sense if we explored it at the continental level or the global level? Uh, we determined a long time ago that the best way to deal with trade is at the global level. The General Agreements on Tariff and Trade in 1947 uh, decided on a course that would systematically over time dismantle trade barriers. And they have. They brought them down very far. Not far enough, but they brought them down very far. That was done at the global level. I'd be in favor of continuing down that path of negotiating between sovereign governments to solve different problems, to create an institution, create a broader sense of identity or of North Americanness as part of an instrument to help us avoid our parochialism and solve shared problems. NAFTA was essentially a business contract aimed at dismantling trade and investment barriers uh, and assuring all three countries that their sovereignty would not be affected by this and that they would remain independent. Now, one of the major concerns uh, that Canada and Mexico had about NAFTA uh, was that it might open their uh, capital to being taken over by U.S. multinational corporations. If you are a large corporation and you are given national treatment with any country, meaning as a corporation, even if you're a foreign corporation, which most of the Canadians, uh, Canada's primary corporations are foreign controlled these days, uh, that you're given the rights of a citizen in that nation with the powers of a citizen. And corporate rule uh, is pretty much free trade. But where it sits right now is that as the corporations have gained uh, the status of citizens, they can challenge our laws. So even if uh, municipalities, federal or provincial bodies establish laws for our country, uh, for the best interest of our country based on our collective will, then the corporations can successfully challenge those laws and sue us for passing laws that infringe upon their investments and in their trade. And these are the provisions that allow a corporation uh, to sue a national government if it feels it is not getting the treatment it would be entitled to under NAFTA. The first case against Canada under the investor state uh, provisions was a, a suit brought by Ethel Corporation from the US that was wanting to market in Canada a gasoline additive called MMT, which is a suspected neurotoxin. It was stated by our government that we're going to ban uh, um, additives to fuel that involve methyl manganese because uh, it's harmful to individuals neurologically and otherwise. It's been linked to attention deficit disorder and other problems. But when we passed those laws, the ethyl group sued our country, said, how dare you pass laws that restrict our trade, and even when we're doing it for the benefit of our own country. Well, Canada, the Canadian government, uh, responded to that suit by effectively apologizing to Ethel by paying them 13 million dollars US in compensation and by withdrawing the ban. So it didn't even have to go through the full adjudication process before Canada backed down. Our country is being defined and shaped by regulatory bodies 
by corporations who have no accountability whatsoever to the Canadian people. I don't see that these, uh, th th this uh, harmonization, unionization is good for the Canadian people, period. Never was, never will be. It needs to stop. Now, there have been 50 uh, suits approximately under the investor state uh, provisions so far. I say approximately because some of them are still secret. We don't know. There have been 19 against Canada, 17 against Mexico, and 14 against the United States. And of these, uh, Canada has, has settled out of court or lost four cases, Mexico has lost three cases, and the United States has not lost any because adjudicators are very reluctant to use this against U.S. When Brian Mulroney uh, proposed the free trade agreement, it was a Canadian initiative. It wasn't that popular at public opinion, but it was a major initiative which um, we initiated, which the U.S. President Ronald Reagan got fully behind. The free trade agreement was, you know, perhaps one of the most dramatic of any period in our history, but there, uh, uh, the public attitudes changed. The public went from negative to positive, and even to this day, I mean, depends the questions you ask, but on the whole, attitudes are fairly positive towards free trade. Free trade is not good for any nation that's involved in free trade. No nation benefits from free trade. How would you feel about a North American Union, kind of like a European Union between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico? I think that would... That would probably not work. That would not work. <laughs> not bad. That wouldn't be a good idea. I think okay. maybe Canada and the U.S. Yeah. would be okay together. Not, I don't think Mexico. They shouldn't do that. Because at that point, Canada is no longer going to be Canada. Canada has a hard enough time keeping its identity. I'm a Canadian, so I want to stick with my country. I, I just can't see uh, that being favorable for a Canadian in any way, shape, or form. We're still under British control, partially. Mm -hmm. So we can't really... So I don't, that wouldn't happen. Like, I, I, doubt I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like it anyways. The World Trade Organization is the only international organization dealing with the global rules of trade between nations. Its main function is to ensure that trade flows as smoothly, predictably, and freely as possible. The result is a more prosperous, peaceful, and accountable economic world. What's the WTO all about? It's all about free. It's all about. Look at these kids up here. They got a sign up that says, don't trade our future. For these young kids in the street today, it's about their future being traded off by corporations who frankly don't give a shit what happens to them. That's what it's about. That's what people are fed up with it. They understand it. Direct action brought these people together. Many of them on the street I've talked to have never been in a direct action before. They feel very empowered. They're, they're starting to understand that people can be empowered and take charge of things themselves. And direct action is perfect for getting people in that role to take charge over their own lives. I go back to the 1988 election, which was bought, fought on the issue of free trade. And the opponents of free trade actually uh, won the majority of the vote. The Mulroney government was elected with a minority, a minority of votes. At that time, we had a high level of participation from all sectors of society. Now, it's true that since then, the issue has faded from consciousness. But I think there are moments uh, when symbolic issues, for example, Canadian water and sovereignty over our fresh water, there still are elements that would like to, to get a hold of that and would like to use some of the possible leverage through NAFTA, including the proportional sharing clause.